at the end. And uh, our speaker tonight is Steve Wise. And Steve is a, a PhD in history from the University of South Carolina, uh, an Ohio native who says his uh, interest in the Civil War was uh, sparked by family vacations and travel when he was uh, uh, just a, a boy and his mom and dad uh, would stop at historical sites, including uh, Fort Sumter, one of his earliest uh, um, memories of Civil War site. And uh, he uh, got his PhD at uh, the Univers University of South Carolina and uh, stayed in South Carolina, I believe since then, and uh, is now the director of the uh, Marine Corps Museum on board uh, Paris Island, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, and also uh, adjunct professor at the uh, University of South Carolina at uh, Beaufort. And uh, his book on uh, blockade running the lifeline of the Confederacy is the book um, on blockade running. If you wanna know uh, how it worked, uh, what the ships were like, what they experienced, uh, Steve's book is the book to look at. So with that, I'll turn it over to Steve Wise. All right, thank you. Am I, everybody, can they hear me all right? Can hear you fine. Okay, well, uh, thank you. In the short time allotted to me, I'd like to talk about blockade running during the Civil War, which created a supply system that was, oh boy, now why aren't I, okay, that was based around very specialized vessels that provided the Confederate armies with the means to fight the war on equal terms with their Northern counterparts. Now, we often do not hear a great deal about logistics and supply systems. Sometimes get the feeling that people don't think that's as sexy as the studying the Confederate military and you know, battles and generals. So I may argue that blockade runners might have been just as sexy as anyone else in the Confederacy. Uh, just ask Rhett Butler about that. Of course, blockade runners tended to look more like this guy here. A few years ago, I was involved in a, a BBC Scotland production termed Ships That Made the Commonwealth, and one episode centered on Glasgow's involvement with the specialized ships employed as blockade runners. Some of the main themes of the show was how blockade running sustained the Confederacy, sparked a revolution in shipbuilding, expanded vessel construction along the Clyde River, and generated employment and tremendous profits for Scottish businessmen and shipbuilders. But at the start of the Civil War, none of this was evident or even thought of. Now, as the story goes, ill-equipped Confederates marched off to war in 1861, bragging that they could, would be able to whip the Yankees using broomsticks. Four years later, when the defeated Confederates returned, they were reminded of their boast and were asked why they had lost, and the sullen Confederates replied that the damn Yankees had refused to fight with broomsticks. Though a popular tale and one that is often repeated to explain away Confederate defeat, the story lacks a historical base. While it is true that the North refused to fight with broomsticks, it is not true that the Southerners fought with broomsticks or with any inadequate weapons. Throughout the war, the Confederate Army was adequately supplied and equipped. It lost no battle due to a lack of munitions, and in some battles, the Southerners had better arms than their adversaries. Another myth that is not true centers on the image of the ragged rebel who fought the war without proper uniforms or shoes. Again, like the broomstick story it has, it's just simply not true. By the end of 1862, the four largest Confederate clothing factories were able to turn out over 500,000 uniforms and 500,000 shoes a year using leather and cloth that came in through the blockade. Even in the last months of the war, the South was capable of more than meeting the needs of its major armies, delivering for each soldier the shattered army of Tennessee after the Battle of Nashville, per soldier, a blanket, a jacket, two shirts, four pairs of pants, shoes, and drawers. The 70,000-man Army of Northern Virginia received over 104,000 jackets, 140,000 trousers, 150,000 shirts, 170,000 drawers, and 160,000 shoes. Now, what I do is I use the term sustained. What blockade running did was give the South the tools to fight, but blockade running could not do everything. 
Blockade running could not effectively deliver locomotives or heavy equipment. It could not efficiently deliver the machinery for factories or marine engines for ironclad warships. This is not to say they didn't try, they did. All types of machinery came through the blockade, but too often pieces were missing or did not fit. If you can imagine constructing a factory or a ship in the South and then trying to design an engine that had to be manufactured overseas, safely run through the blockade, taken to its destination, and then reassembled. Uh, such projects rarely worked. Also, heavy equipment took up too much space on board the ships, cut into your profits. To give you an example, this is the blockade runner Gibraltar. She brought in the two largest cannons used by the Confederacy. But this was all that the Gibraltar could carry on that run through the blockade. These huge British-built Blakely guns had to be loaded with their muzzles pointing up, giving the vessel the appearance of having three smokestacks, something along this line here. Uh, Might have looked like this when she came into Wilmington. The artillery pieces did not stay in Wilmington. They were shipped to Charleston, where they never fired a shot. Blockade running has been termed a tenuous supply line, and in many ways it was quite tenuous. For most of the war, the Confederate government refused to take an active role in regulating the trade. It would not do for a nation fighting to toss off government regulations to impose restrictions on free enterprise. Lack of government involvement left most blockade running in the hands of private businessmen. Such a situation could have been tenuous, but what made it work will be profit. The lure of vast sums of money kept blockade running working throughout the war. It would have been tenuous if the motivating factor of profit disappeared. However, the profit margin increased as the war went on and the blockade running lifeline was never threatened. Just to give you a good example, and I will use uh, both uh, amounts from the period and from today. Uh, this, uh, this is based around a blockade runner known as the Zephine. Zephine was a sister ship of the uh, vessel you see here. She was sold to blockade running interest for $100,000 in gold, which would be about $2 million in today's money. Her payroll was about $36,000 in gold, or about $720,000 in today's money. On her first trip, she carried into Galveston a valuable cargo and took out 1,000 bales of cotton. She turned a profit in excess of $300,000 in gold, or $6 million in today's money more than enough to pay for the ship, the crew's wages, and the inward cargo. From then on, the profits will roll in. Because of the fortunes that could be made, munitions, uniforms, uniform material, leather, food, all poured into the Confederacy by way of its ports on board steam blockade runners. These specialized ships were the vital element of the Confederate supply system. Their importance cannot be underestimated. They were the main reason that the South was able to sustain its war effort. But again, at the start of the Civil War, neither this nor the complex system of blockade running was foreseen, nor did anyone realize the role of such cities as Wilmington, Charleston, Mobile, and a little bit Galveston would be part of this uh, crucial element of the Confederate supply system. What was foreseen was the fact that the United States would immediately blockade or establish a blockade against the seceded states. <coughs> Excuse me. And on April 19th, 1861, the Lincoln, Lincoln government adopted a naval blockade to stop foreign goods from reaching the South. This was the date that the blockade was declared, but it's going to take time for the North to outfit warships and station them off the coast. But at first, the Confederacy did not put much effort in developing overseas connections. Instead, the nation placed its reliance on a policy known as King Cotton. This was an economic and political philosophy based on the course of power of Southern cotton. It held that without cotton, the British textile industry would be ruined and the British economy would collapse. In order to avoid such a disaster, the Southerners believed the British would have to intervene. Even though the European powers recognized the blockade, the Southerners did not sway from their faith in cotton. And during the summer of 1861, local politicians, merchants, newspaper men, planters banded together to enforce an embargo to keep the South's cotton at home. Though never sanctioned by the government, the embargo was unofficially approved by Jefferson Davis and his advisors, who felt it would bring Great Britain into the war. 
At the same time, though, in order to aid the financially disrupted planters who aren't getting their cotton, their bales of cotton or sacks of cotton to market, the Confederate government purchased 400,000 bales of cotton, issuing the uh, cotton planters uh, bonds. Uh, yeah. They felt they had to do this, but at that time, no one was quite sure what the Confederacy would do with all this cotton. Now, while most waited for British intervention, there were two very important exceptions. The first was Josiah Gorgas, chief of the Confederacy's Ordnance uh, Bureau. He later goes on to be a general. Uh, had, he had, Gorgas had three methods to outfit the Confederate armed forces, existing supplies, home production, and imports. By using the armed seas in the Southern arsenals, Gorgas had enough weapons and supplies to outfit the initial 100,000 men called out by President Davis. Unlike others in the South, though, Gorgas did not believe that the war would be a quick one, and he knew that his on-hand stocks of munitions would soon disappear. So what he really planned to do is to put forward or have constructed or established or rework the Confederate factories into munition plants that would make the new nation self-sustaining. But it's going to take time for these factories to be completed. So Gorgas realized that certain, as he put it, articles of prime necessity would have to be shipped from Europe. Imports were supposed to be only a stopgap measure, something to fill the void between the depletion of existing stocks and the beginning of home production. But try as they might, the Confederates will never be able to meet their needs through domestic industrial plants. The flow of imports will grow until they eventually become the most important element of the Confederate supply system. Uh, this is the powder works at Augusta, Georgia. In April 1861, in order to gain foreign supplies, Gorgas dispatched Captain Caleb Hughes to Great Britain. Uh, this photograph is the only one I've been able to find of Hughes. This is Hughes in 1910. Uh, he went to Great Britain to serve as a purchasing agent. Hughes was later joined by Major Edward C. Anderson, and together they began to work with Commander James D. Bullock, the purchasing agent for the Navy Department. They were to purchase everything from uniforms, the letterhead stationery, to munitions and warships. They had been provided with funds through bills of exchange, basically lines of credit that the uh, Southerners had in Great Britain, but they had no way to ship in their supplies. Well, now comes in that other exception to the cotton embargo. George Alfred Trenum, director of the Charleston Bay Shipping Company, John Fraser and Company, and the Liverpool-based Fraser Trenum and Company, which was headed up by his partner, Charles K. Prelu. Though an ardent patriot, Trenum also saw the war as an opportunity to make a sizable profit and make his firms the Confederacy's premier overseas shipping companies. He had an office in Charleston, as an office in Liverpool. Together, Trenum and the Ordnance uh, Bureau agents in Great Britain through Prelu will collaborate to run a steamer through the blockade. And this is going to be the Bermuda. Let's see if we can go back to the Bermuda. There's the Bermuda there. Uh, Prelu charged a very high price for the Confederate agents to put their goods on board the uh, Bermuda, but really this is the only way that they could get to, you might say, to deliver their goods. And they met Prelu's price and on September 18th, 1861. After an uneventful voyage, the Bermuda successfully arrived at Savannah, Georgia, becoming the first steam blockade runner to reach the South. After landing her cargo, the Bermuda returned to Liverpool with over 2,000 bales of profit. I'm sorry, of cotton. Profits were tremendous, and her example soon caused other firms to organize blockade running ventures. While the Bermuda's success inspired additional blockade running companies, it did little to relieve the problems confronting the Confederate purchasing agents. They still had no government owned vessels to carry their munitions, and the private firms were escalating their rates on government cargoes. Anderson, the senior agent, decided it was best to purchase a, their own steamer. And with financial help from the Navy Department, the steamer Fingal was obtained and sent through the blockade, arriving at Savannah in mid-November. Equipment from the Fingal was enough to outfit 10 Confederate regiments. As Bullock stated, she carried one of the greatest military cargoes ever imported into the Confederacy.
Thel also carried, uh, had on board with her, uh, it's going to be Anderson. Uh, Anderson is going to go to Richmond, where he uh, is going to push the concept of government-owned blockade runners. But Anderson found no backers. Neither the War nor the Navy Department would consider any involvement with blockade running. Officials preferred to leave it in the hands of private shippers while they waited for British intervention. Disillusioned with the results of his visit, Anderson returned to Savannah, where he served out the war as an artillery officer. While Anderson began working on Savannah's defenses, Hughes continued to purchase supplies in Europe. Thanks to King Cotton, the Confederate government and states taking over vessels for warships, no Southern ships were arriving in Great Britain. But British businessmen, eyeing great rewards, were beginning to enter the trade. Among them is going to be an individual known as Thomas Taylor. When the war started, Taylor worked for the Edward Lawrence and Company, a prominent Liverpool shipping firm. All enterprising traders carefully watched the events unfolding in the United States. And as Taylor noted, my fortunes and those of my dearest friends seem to be bound up in a piece of history that promised to leave its mark on the world. Taylor and his fellow entrepreneurs were not intimidated by Lincoln's blockade, nor did they pay any attention to the, uh, their nation's stance on neutrality and Queen Victoria's proclamation that asked the British businessmen and companies to stay out of the conflict. Taylor was soon appointed the supercargo for his co company's blockade running firm, which was called the Angle Confederate Trading Company. Taylor and other British companies were quick to, uh, to contract with Hughes, who hired them to take goods into the Confederacy. Hughes, uh, th these, these supplies that, that Hughes is going to contract to have come in are going to arrive initially by two methods. One, he contracted for direct delivery to the South by British shippers. Uh, this is large vessels that could come directly into the Confederacy. Or, and this will become the preferred way as the war goes on, uh, they will send uh, cargoes to Havana, to Nassau and the Bahamas, uh, where they were transferred to steamers for the final run through the blockade. It's going to be the latter system of transporting or transshipping to prove the most popular. And by early 1862, vessels owned by British blockade running companies, by Trenum's firms and other Southerners, uh, Southern back ventures were operating between Havana and Nassau and the Confederacy. For their services, the private shippers charged the government extremely high rates, which Hughes and other Southern agents had to meet. Now assisting Hughes were Confederate consuls, Charles J. Helm in Havana, Louis Heliger in Nassau. Besides serving as government representatives, the two consuls had the crucial responsibility of making sure that cargoes received from Hughes were properly transshipped. Both performed admirably, but because of the early capture of New Orleans, Heliger and Nassau soon found himself overseeing the bulk of the supplies coming from Great Britain. During the spring and summer of 1862, Heliger worked at Nassau with private shippers to deliver vital munitions. The task posed difficult problems. Heliger paid extraordinary fees for cargo space, and even then he found that many companies refused to work with him, preferring to carry the more profitable civilian goods rather than the bulky and often dangerous munitions. The best deals were made with Trenum's firms, who gave the government preferred rates, but not enough, not enough to threaten their profit margin. It has been estimated that Trenum and his partners made around $20 million, or about today's money, $400 million through blockade running. The huge profits amazed Trenum's partner, Prelu, in Liverpool. And he wrote to Trenum that the ledger reads to me more like an Arabian Nights entertainment than the results of a year or two of commercial operations. Heaven knows I never coveted the possession of so much wealth. And it's gratifying to know that in the accumulation of it, you have had in your power to confer the greatest assistance upon our struggling, bleeding, and oppressed nation. Uh, this is one of their vessels here. This is the Margaret and Jesse. She was reputed to be the fastest of all the blockade runners, some claiming she could make up to 18 knots. Prelo is going to go on and suggest that he run in a glass warehouse with an English gardener for Trenum's Charleston home, Ashley Hall. 
He thought that this would show to everyone that the blockade was a sham and raise morale in the North. As far as I know, the greenhouse and gardener never arrived, but those Southerners who could afford it could use blockade running to keep up a high lifestyle. Trenum's firms were willing to offer special rates to the Confederacy, but British manufacturers and shippers cautiously regulated their involvement with Hughes, who continued to purchase uh, supplies with reckless abandon, so much so that by the end of 1862, the Confederate purchasing agent was 900,000 pounds in debt, which would be about $27 million in today's money, and his means of payment was assumed at an end. Without some form of exchange, Hughes's operations would collapse, and then suddenly the Confederacy discovered a new use for King Cotton. When the South's cotton embargo failed to bring Great Britain to the war, many thought that the over 400,000 bales of cotton purchased by the government at the war's start would become the predicted white elephant, but this was not the case. Cotton, so long a instrument of foreign policy, was now converted to a medium of exchange. Following the lead of the Navy Department, the government began to use cotton to finance its overseas ventures. By employing the cotton purchase early in the war as collateral, the Confederacy began issuing a variety of cotton bonds. Now, just like today, there are two ways to make a profit off the bonds. An investor could hold the bond, collect interest every month, and redeem the bond at its face value after a set period of time, or the investor could bring the bond to the Confederacy and received cotton. It was the latter method that made the bond so popular. Cotton could be obtained in the South at about 10 cents a pound, or in today's money, about $2 a pound, and then sold in Great Britain for 50 cents a pound, or $10 a pound in today's money, thus making a $50 bale of cotton purchased in Charleston worth nearly $1,000 in Liverpool. Or again, to use today's money, that $1,000 cotton or cotton bale in Liverpool would be worth $20,000. The use of bonds allowed the Confederacy to pay off debts, provided funds for additional supplies. They were the basis for contracts between the South and its suppliers, and were also used to finance the purchasing and construction of blockade runners and warships. Private blockade running ventures used them to guarantee outward cargoes for their steamers, because with the bonds and the right type of vessel, blockade running could be an extremely profitable business. Many war departments, bureaus such as subsistence, medical and quartermaster bureaus use the bonds to enter into one-sided partnerships with blockade running companies. These agreements tremendously favored the private firms. Because of the need of supplies though, most government agencies felt that a bad contract was better than no contract. Now, initially the private blockade running companies favored running their supplies from Nassau into Charleston, South Carolina. But this tended to overburden facilities and restrict the amount of military supplies reaching the Southern arsenals and armies. The bottlenecks at Nassau and Charleston worried uh, the Confederate Ordnance Chief Josiah Gorgaz. Though he had hoped that the Confederacy could build its own munition plants and be self-sufficient in arms production, by late 1861, he realized his bureau would be becoming more and more dependent on importing supplies. Now, unlike other government bureaus, Gorgas realized the advantage of using government-owned and operated vessels. Instead of making contracts with blockade-running firms, Gorgas had his agents purchase steamers in Great Britain, and he established a blockade running office at Wilmington under the command of his brother-in-law, Thomas L. Bain. A depot headed up by Major Norman S. Walker was established in St. George, Bermuda. From St. George, the goods purchased uh, and shipped from Great Britain were transferred to Ordnance Bureau steamers and sent to Wilmington, North Carolina, where they were met by Captain James Satius, uh, he was head of the Wilmington Bureau. Uh, Wilmington was chosen because as yet, uh, the port was for the most part unused by private blockade runners. Now this line established by Gorgaz and operated by Bain employed five vessels, all bought with Confederate cotton certificates. The most successful were the Cornubia, the Robert E. Lee and the Eugenie, captained by Furl Naval officers, Richard Gale, John Wilkinson and Joseph Fry. 
A typical cargo consisted of cases of Enfield rifles, cartridges, leather, knapsacks, stationery, sewing thread, lead, saltpeter, and uniform cloth. Though only in service from November of 1862 until November 1863, Gorgaz's vessels made 47 runs through the blockade. They delivered at Wilmington, among other things, nearly 100,000 Enfield rifles, tens of thousands of cartridges, and thousands of pounds of saltpeter, all basic necessities needed by the Confederacy to stay alive. Now, the vessels operated by Gorgaz were products of an ongoing evolution in ship design and construction that was brought about by blockade running. Early in the war, it was quickly realized that sailing ships just will not do. Uh, sailing ships large enough to carry a gainful amount of cargo were easy marks for steam blockade running, uh, steam block, steam powered warships. Steam warships had ended the day of sail powered blockade runners. So to counter their pursuers, the blockade runners also turned to steam engines. The first successful runners were small converted shallow drafted packets. They had sh uh, shallow drafts, were maneuverable. However, they were not very fast and had limited cargo space. They would take all the state uh, rooms off them. Basically, they would look like this, pile cotton up uh, all the way up. So all you could really see was the smokestack and the walking beam engine. So as the war continued, so did the search for the perfect vessel. And in a short time, a ship did emerge that helped revolutionize conventional shipbuilding. The class of steamer that started this maritime revolution are those that are found in the United Kingdom's coastal and cross-channel passenger trade. Since many had been built on the Clyde River in and around Glasgow, Scotland, they were nicknamed Clyde Steamers. They were rugged, fast, maneuverable, had a shallow draft and a large cargo capacity. It was this style of vessel that Gorgas purchased for the Ordnance Bureau. And after some renovations, these sleek greyhounds of the sea soon made a mockery of the federal blockade. Some of them had great, great names, as you can see here. This is the Let Her Rip. About 80 Clyde steamers became blockade runners, but soon businessmen demanded even better vessels. Now, among the uh, most famous was a vessel owned by the state of North Carolina, uh, which was purchased uh, with state bonds and was used to run in supplies that could be used to support the state's war effort. The vessel was named the Lord Clyde. She arrived in Wilmington in June of 1863. Her registry will be changed and she was renamed the Advance. Whereas Clyde steamers like the Advance and others made excellent blockade runner, uh, the businessmen wanted bigger, faster vessels so to make more money. And as a result, new and experimental ships were built to run the blockade. Most were side wheelers, but there was a number of experimental twin screws that saw excellent service during the war. Uh, these vessels had the ability to turn on, the, on their keel, which was a great advantage when trying to escape a pursuer. While the war was the first major use of twin screw vessels, the mainstay of blockade running will be the paddle wheel steamers. They were faster than twin squirrels, uh, screws. They were uh, quicker to accelerate, uh, they uh, could rock themselves by putting the uh, paddle wheels in different directions should they run aground. And by 1863, side wheel steamers were being built in Great Britain just specifically to run the blockade. The first vessel built as a blockade runner was the steel hauled side wheeler Banshee, built for the Lawrence, Edward Lawrence and Company. She was the first ship designed and constructed as a blockade runner. She measured 220 feet by 20 feet by 12 feet, had a flat bottom, four watertight compartments, and made of steel plates one third of an inch thick. Her draft was only eight feet. In April 1863, she crossed the Atlantic, a feat she accomplished with a great deal of luck. Her plates were badly fitted, causing the ship to leak. Her engines were too powerful for her frame, and their vibrations caused the Banshee to buckle and rivets to crumble. Still, she survived the voyage and after repairs arrived at Wilmington on May 13, 1863. Motivated by profit, British ship industry was soon turning out vessels with revolutionary designs. They had rounded deck structures, underwater blow-off pipes, hinged masts, 
and telescoping smokestacks. Engine size was increased as was the size and number of boilers. For additional speed, vessels were made longer with extremely narrow beams. By the end of the war, British shipbuilders had overcome numerous problems to produce such ships as the Colonel Lamb, which measured 280 feet by 36 feet by 15 feet. She could carry over 2,000 bales of cotton, which translated into a net profit of at least 300,000 on a single voyage. Now, these vessels are needed. By December of 1863, all of Gorgaz's ships had been lost. At first, the Confederate government did not replace them, but instead increased the reliance on private vessels. Now, as important as the ships were the captains and the crews. The crews were usually foreign born or British or Irish. Uh, if you were a Southerner, you would usually change, uh, if you could, on some sort of certificate that you were born in Great Britain or Ireland or overseas. Because if you were a Confederate or a Southerner captured, you'd be sent to a prisoner of war camp if you were a foreigner, uh, you'd be questioned, held for a while, and then released. Uh, there are a number of British captains who tried their hand at uh, blockade running, such as uh, Hobart Hampton, captain of the Don, one of the twin screw vessels, later goes on to be an admiral in the Turkish Navy. Another, Scottish Johannes Wiley of the Advance, and there's a uh, going to be, I'm sorry, where is Wiley? I skipped past Wiley there. I'm sorry, John. There's Wiley there. Uh, uh, there's a, going to be a forthcoming biography of him soon to be available and to learn about him and the advance. Uh, others are going to be very important are going to be those uh, captains who had operated vessels along the southern coast before the war. These are men like uh, James Carlin. He's an Englishman who worked for the U.S. Uh, Coast Survey before the war, uh, knew the Southern Coast very, very well. Louis Coxeter, he was a Canadian, and the Lockwood brothers of Charleston, South Carolina. These experienced mariners could serve as both captains and pilot. Their expertise was such that there would be bidding wars between companies for their service. And you thought free agency was a new phenomenon. The system was very basic. Large cargo ships would bring supplies to the islands and carry cotton back to Great Britain. At ports like Nassau, Bermuda, Havana, and even Halifax, Canada, the supplies would be warehoused and transferred to blockade runners uh, that would carry these vessels. There we go. What the heck is going on there? I'm sorry, going the wrong way. Okay. that would carry these vessels, uh, carry these supplies into the Confederacy. These supplies uh, could be military or goods for sale on the domestic market. Anything for a price could be brought in through the blockade, furniture, wine, carpet. Besides uh, sending in items consigned to individuals and businesses, blockade running companies uh, brought in merchandise that could be sold at public auctions throughout the South. Demand coupled with inflation and Confederate paper money led to very high prices. Let's give you some examples at auctions at Charleston uh, by 1863, a keg of nails, $12,000. Ladies cotton hose, $165 per dozen. Soap, $37 per dozen. A hoop skirt cost $60. The type of exchange used to purchase goods also varied. Confederate money was virtually useless. useless. By the fall of 1864, $1 gold was equal to 26 Confederate dollars. Gold and sterling exchange was nearly impossible to find in the South. Both, most businessmen used bonds, but even these were hard to obtain. In October, cotton bonds were selling for 200% over their face value, while the 8% treasury bonds were selling at 105 to 130% of their face value and going up every day. To keep up with the rising costs in their businesses, merchants passed the inflated costs onto their customers, which of course placed a tremendous financial burden on Southerners. Just give you an idea, by the end of the war, one gold dollar was worth 45 Confederate paper dollars. The companies operated their ships from Nassau, Bermuda, Havana, sometimes, though not very often, Halifax, Canada. From Nassau and Bermuda, the steamers delivered their cargoes to Charleston and Wilmington on the East Coast, while Havana served as a jumping off point for New Orleans, Mobile, and Galveston in the Gulf. 
Many thought that New Orleans at the start of the war would be the South's uh, main blockade running port. It was the Confederacy's greatest cotton port, but the city was er easily blockaded. Uh, you could get into the mouth of the river and in the city will be captured in April of 1862. So Mobile then became the Gulf's primary blockade running port but a shallow harbor and poor internal communications inland restricted its use. Though the blockade runner Denby, and the Denby will be the war's second most successful blockade runner, made good use of Mobile. Texas had a long coastline, but few efficient harbors and no direct railroad lines to the east. Galveston was the best harbor, but military goods arriving at Galveston did not make it across the Mississippi River. After the fall of Mobile, the Denby moved her trade to Galveston. The most popular routes were from Nassau to Charleston. Uh, that was about a 48 hour run. And from Bermuda to Wilmington, that's about 72 hours. For the first two years of the war, Charleston was the Confederacy's primary blockade running port. Then after the attack on Charleston during the summer of 1863, the bulk of the trade shifted to Wilmington, making it the South's main port of entry. Uh, twice as many blockade runners came into Wilmington uh, than all the other ports combined. It made Wilmington, one could argue, and I would definitely argue, the most important and strategic spot of the Confederacy. What made Conf Wilmington so popular was its two well-defended entrances to the Cape Fear River. And you can see them here on this map. Uh, new Inlet, uh, a little shallower. Then the main inlet, the main inlet uh, is the old inlet into the Cape Fear River. Larger vessels would come in there. Smaller vessels could come into the new inlet, very well uh, defended. And the way uh, the shoals are, frying pan shoals divide the two inlets. So the Union blockading squadron was split. Uh, those on one side of frying pan shoals couldn't really assist those on the other side. Again, giving all the advantages to the blockade runners. New Inlet was guarded by the formidable Fort Fisher. Supplies arriving at Wilmington were placed on board trains with finished goods going to the military depots in Atlanta and Richmond, while unfinished goods were forwarded to factories throughout the South. Now, Wilmington will feel the effects of blockade running. In September 1862, the blockade runner Kate brought yellow fever to the town before it subsided over 700 people. 15% of the town's population will die. Wilmington also suffered under the invasion of personnel involved in wartime shipping, many of which the city's, uh, city's pre-war population found distasteful and disruptive. A proud city, Wilmington was unable to keep up its pre-war culture and soon the town's lifestyle collapsed under the senior aspects of the trade. Well-paid crew members and blockade runners roamed the city, spending their money on whatever entertainment and pleasure they could buy. Shipping firms set up houses for their employees that soon turned into brothels and dens of ill repute. As one wartime visitor noted, Wilmington was the meanest place in the Confederacy. However, the men who caused the problems were essential to the survival of the Confederacy. The ships manned by the sailors had a tremendous success rate. During the war, steam blockade runners were successful on 75 to 80% of their runs. And most of the time, the ships passed in and out unseen. The vessels had the advantage of speed and surprise over their adversaries. And in some cases, there was even more danger sailing across the Atlantic or entering and leaving harbors in the islands, such as this vessel, the Mary Celestia, that was sunk off Bermuda. Rarely while running the blockade would a cannon shell find its mark, and even then the Union warships did not try to sink the blockade runners, for when captured, most blockade runners were taken north, condemned at prize courts, and sold with their cargoes at auction. The resulting money was then divided among the captors, thus making it far more advantageous for northern crews to capture rather than sink the runners. And at the same time, foreigners found on board, including the crew, would eventually be released. Now the trade did take on atmosphere of romance and intrigue with their devil captains and their crews becoming high seas cavaliers, and there are a number of unique and thrilling stories to be told about blockade runners. 
One centers around a well-known vessel that uh, was known as the Armstrong, a paddle wheel ship that made a number of runs into Wilmington, often carrying canned meat for Lee's army. Though a new ship, the Armstrong was poorly constructed and often had mechanical problems. Her commander was Michael Usina, one of the youngest men to command a blockade runner. Usina gained a reputation as a competent and successful runner. And he was also known for what Usina thought was his good luck charm. That was his dog Tinker that would accompany him on his runs through the blockade. Uh, Tinker was also known as a good ratter. Blockade running also assisted the Confederate spy system. Agents were run out on blockade runners, returned on the fast vessels when their missions were completed. Spies were sent to Canada. Missions were planned to use blockade runners to free prisoners kept at prisoner of war camps located along the coast. In one uh, case, the famous Southern spy, Belle Boyd, was captured while on a blockade runner. She managed to gain the release of the vessel's captain and herself eventually by seducing the naval ensign in charge of the prize. Another story that involves not only a female spy but also Wilmington concerns the spy Rose O'Neill Greenhow, a Southern agent who had given the Union plans for the battle of First Bull Run to General Beauregard. After the battle, she had been arrested and imprisoned by federal authorities until sent south in the spring of 1862. In August 1863, she was on board a steamer that successfully ran the blockade. Rose went to Europe where she became an instant celebrity and was involved in Confederate affairs. While in Great Britain, she wrote her autobiography. In late summer of 1864, she decided to return to the South. Yeah. Her belongings were official dispatches and nearly 2,000 in gold sovereigns. Proceeds from her book, which she planned to donate to relief organizations. She was returning on board the Condor, a new paddle wheel steamer that had a unique arrangement of smokestacks. The Condor was commanded by William Nathan Wright Hewitt, a Royal Navy captain who had taken leave from the Queen's service to try his hand at blockade running. Sailing from Halifax, the Condor arrived off New Inlet early on the morning of October 1st, 1864. Hewitt maneuvered the vessel through the outer line of the blockade, but as he neared the bar, the Condor was sighted. A gunboat started chase. Hewitt pushed on, but as the Condor neared safety, a ship's silhouette loomed ahead, and the pilot turned the vessel hard to the starboard, running her aground. Though the silhouette proved not to be an enemy gunboat, but rather the derelict blockade runner Nighthawk, the position of the Condor was precarious. If she survived the pounding of the waves and enemy shells, it might be possible to free her in the morning. But Mrs. Greenhow would not wait and demanded that she be put ashore in a small boat. Attempts to dissuade her were fruitless and she was put in a boat with four others who attempted to reach the shore through the rough surf. The small boat capsized and although four men survived, Mrs. Greenhow weighed down by her gold drowned. The next morning her body was discovered The gold was found to be missing. It was eventually recovered and given over to relief organizations. Rose Greenhow was given a military funeral and she was buried in Wilmington. Now the high rate of success and resulting profits saw the private companies dominating the trade until August of 1863, when the Confederate government was finally forced to take an active role in blockade running. Defeats at Gettysburg and Vicksburg not only caused a tremendous demand for additional supplies, they also caused a severe crisis within the Southern bond market that shattered the Confederacy's overseas finances. In order to revive their credit and gain new supplies, Secretary of War Seddon turned to an expanded use of cotton. He ordered his uh, commanders at Wilmington, Charleston, and Mobile to requisition cargo space for the shipment of government cotton. The operators of blockade runners were paid a, paid a fair price for the space, but any refusal would result in their uh, vessels being seized. This was only the beginning of Seddon's plans. By March 1864, his initial instructions were tightened and with presidential approval made into law. The stricter, stricter regulations allow the Confederacy to take up to 50% of a vessel's outward and inward cargo space. This guaranteed the government cotton needed to pay for European goods and inward cargo storage space for munitions. At the same time, Gorgaz's Bureau was expanded to supervise all government shipping. 
In Europe, operations were consolidated under the control of Colin J. McRae, who in effect became the Confederacy's European Secretary of Treasury. The unheralded McRae did a remarkable job in organizing the different overseas agents into a centralized system. He also revived the plans of Anderson and Gorgas for a line of Confederate-owned blockade runners. Fourteen vessels were ordered in Great Britain, and McRae planned to eventually to end all contracts with private firms and use these blockade runners for government supplies. McRae was soon joined by a new official who also realized the importance of government-sponsored blockade running. During the summer of 1864, the Confederacy called upon the director of the war's largest blockade running corporation, George Alfred Trenum, to become the nation's secretary of the treasury. Trenum accepted the position, resigned from his companies, and soon added his expertise to running the government's overseas operations. He placed even more stricter regulations and made plans for the 14 blockade runners being built in Great Britain. However, only six of these specialized vessels would ever join the Confederate service before the war ended. Initially, though, there was a tremendous outpouring of criticism from private shippers and state governors over the new regulations. Many viewed them as an infringement on their rights as businessmen. Some threatened to quit the business, but few did. Instead, by using newer and larger vessels, shippers were able to make their losses up by carrying more cargo. This coupled with the generous shipping rates paid by the Confederacy and the fact that cotton prices were still on the rise in Europe allowed the blockade runners to maintain their extraordinary profits. The lure of money also brought rumors uh, runners back to Charleston where small, smaller vessels were able to reach the city. In the end, only a few of the Confederacy's super blockade runners were completed. Uh, this is the bat, but she is going to be captured early in her career. But even without the super blockade runners, the flow of supplies continued. Under Trenum and McRae's guidance, the Confederacy received more munitions per month than at any time during the war. As both Charleston and Wilmington continued as major ports of entry. But Seddon, McRae, and Trenum were fighting a losing battle. While they were able to keep the Confederacy's military supplied with necessary food and equipment, the South was suffering under the continuous campaigns of Grant and Sherman and from massive desertions, and they were running out of men. Nor could they keep their vital ports open. August 1864, Mobile Harbor was occupied. Fort Fisher, guardian of Wilmington, was taken in early January, 1865, and a month later, Charleston was evacuated. And captured at Charleston was the Siren, the war's most successful blockade runner. She had made 33 runs through the blockade. Immediately activities at Bermuda and at Nassau are going to cease. Those who could will shift to Havana because Galveston remained open with vessels making some 20 round trips to the Texas port after the fall of Charleston and Wilmington, bringing in over 10,000 small arms, munitions, and uniforms. But by mid-May 1865, the commanders in the Trans-Mississippi Department were beginning to accept the inevitable. Troops were deserting, and in Galveston, troops were looting Confederate stores before leaving. On May 22nd, the Confederates requested an armistice. While awaiting their supply on May 23rd, the Denby, now ranked second only to the Siren in successful runs, came into the harbor, and this was her 27th trip through the blockade. But she ran aground on Bird Key, and her crew fled to Galveston. The next day, the blockade runner Lark arrived at Galveston. Once docked, she was overrun by soldiers who stripped her of her cargo. Then after picking up the Denby's crew, the captain of the Lark is going to dash out to sea. The Lark was the last steam blockade runner to enter and leave the Confederacy. Nine days later, the Confederate leaders of the Trans-Mississippi Department will surrender the final remains of the Confederacy. On June 5, 1865, led by the former blockade runner Cornubia, now a Union gunboat, she came into Galveston Harbor and you could say close the Confederacy's last blockade running port. Because of the determined work of a few relatively unknown captains, sailors, government officials, entrepreneurs like Thomas Taylor and others, 
the economic power of cotton and the specialized steamers, the Confederate military was never without the means to fight. From the first run of the Bermuda to the last escape of the Lark from Galveston, about 300 steamers tested the blockade. Out of 1,300 attempts, over 1,000 were successful, a success rate, again, between 75 and 80 percent. The average lifetime of a steam blockade runner was two round trips or four trips through the blockade. The blockade runner siren made 33 trips through the blockade. They carried out a total of 350,000 bales of cotton worth almost $25 million or in today's money, $500 million. Because of this, the South was able to import 60% of its modern arms, 30% of the lead used for bullets, 75% of the Army's saltpeter used to make gunpowder, and nearly all the paper to make cartridges. Number of field pieces were run through the blockade, including Blakely and the more famous breech-loading Whitworth rifles. The majority of cloth for uniforms. Uh, uniforms tended to be somewhat between these two, uh, more like this fellow here. Also coming into the blockade, leather for shoes and accoutrements as well as huge amounts of metals, chemicals, and medicine. And for the last months of the war, the Army of Northern Virginia received the bulk of its food via blockade runners. Thanks to profit, the blockade, uh, the, the, thanks to the profit, blockade running worked, and the lifeline stayed alive until the ports were captured. Defeat did not come from a lack of material. In fact, by the end of the war, the South had more munitions and goods than men, and manpower was something that blockade runners could not supply. After the war, the entire fabric of blockade running came apart. Well-managed companies made spectacular profits. In the case of Taylor's firm, the Anglo-Confederate company, this translated into a 2,500% increase over the original cost of a share of stock. But others, especially those who put their profits back in the Confederate bonds, lost everything. My favorite is always the Charleston-based Consolidated Blockade Running Company. Had no ships, no cotton, just investors. The president of the firm fled to New York with the money. But even so, the specialized ships at the end of the war will lose their value. Vessels that had cost 100000 during the war brought only 15000 after the war. Some returned to ferry boat service while others served as cargo carriers. A few were purchased by navies, becoming, some historians claim, the prototype of dispatch vessels and fast gunboats. Some served as slavers, taking slaves to Brazil, while others ran arms uh, to rebels in Cuba, like the Virgin here. Few survived into the 20th century. Uh, one, the Chicora, she'll be taken to the Great Lakes. So where she will serve as a ferry boat until 1910. Uh, when she was converted into a barge and the barge will continue to be used until 1930. The longest lived blockade runner was a little Ada. She survived until 1947 when she sank in Long Island Sound. Of the 300 steamers, about 80 were sunk. Some have been salvaged, but the wrecks of others still remain and are studied by underwater archaeologists. They reveal information about ships, about the ship's construction, about marine engines, boilers, and cargo. A number of these wrecks are at Charleston and Wil Wilmington and are still being studied today, and you can legitimately say that the story of blockade running still continues. All in all, it's a fascinating story, sustained by prophets, Blockade running worked. Blockade running gave the Confederates the necessary material to meet their adversaries. Southerners did not fight with broomsticks or any other inadequate equipment. While their numbers were not equal to the Federals, the Southerners were properly outfitted throughout the war. The South owed a large debt to the men who operated the blockade running system. Their work kept the nation alive and gave it, you might say, the opportunity for victory. And it also gave us our greatest fictional character as one can never escape, the ghost of Rhett Butler.